Acts chapter 16. We, uh, we got all the way through verse 8 last week. And so we're going to pick back up in verse 9. And, uh, and we're going to see what the Lord has to say to us through the church of uh, the New Testament. Uh, through uh, Paul's missionary trips, through some of the problems that he faces, some of the victories he sees, some of the attacks waged against him. Uh, we don't just look at this and study this as a matter of history. Uh, we study it and, and look at it as a matter of practical today application. Uh, the enemy's tactic has never changed. His MO is exactly the same all the way back to the garden. It's deception. Uh, Jesus says he's the father of lies, and basically when he speaks, uh, he lies, and it's his native tongue. And so he, he does all of that. He works through different agencies and organizations and, and individuals, uh, but he really comes against the church in, in a very similar way every time we see him do it. So we can learn a lot just by looking at the stuff that Paul went through and the things that we see through the, the church here uh, across his missionary journey. So let's pick up and begin reading in verse uh, 9. He says, Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Do not be afraid, but keep on speaking. Don't be silent, for I am with you. And no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. And he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the judge's bench. This man, they said, persuades people to worship contrary to the law. And as Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of a crime or of a moral evil, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I don't want to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the judge's bench, and then they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judge's bench. But none of these things concerned Gallio. Now, a lot of stuff going on here and a lot of things that, that would be kind of uh, simple to overlook. Uh, so we're, we're going to try to look at some of those things in detail. So many of the people in Corinth have put their faith in Jesus. We see that Paul is having su success. But what have we talked about for the last several, several weeks? When the church sees success, what else do we see? Attacks. We see problems, we see issues, and, and the issues he, must have, he was facing, the resistance he was facing must have been pretty substantial uh, because the Lord appeared to him in a vision to tell him to stay the course. Now, did anybody catch that Paul needed to be encouraged? Can, can, can anybody relate to that? Has, is anybody here, you don't have to hold your hand up. I mean, I, I'm, has anybody in here ever felt just discouraged and you really just needed a word of encouragement? that you just needed somebody to tell you it's going to be okay. You just needed somebody to come alongside you and say, hey, man, I, I've walked where you're walking. I've lived uh, in, in a period like you're living in, and I'm just here to tell you that I'm living proof that you can survive it. I think that's where Paul was, and, and I just want to float this out there. This is free. It's not in my notes, but uh, maybe somebody is counting on you to be that person for them. I'm going to remind you, sometimes we get this poor, poor, pitiful me down in the mouth I oh, can't do nothing. You know, that, that Eeyore, you know, well, it's probably going to rain. You know, we just get that negative. You, you don't, again, you don't have to be on the stage in, in, under the lights in the pulpit. You don't have to teach a class or be an elder or a deacon. Sometimes you can just have somebody's phone number and shoot them a text and say, hey, I love you. I'm praying for you. It's going to be okay. Sometimes it's just a matter of writing a card. I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm stuck on this, and I'm sorry, but I'm just stuck on this. If you'll write the card and bring it to the church, tell us who you want it sent to, we'll address it, stamp it, and put it in the mail. Sometimes that one little encouraging note or text or phone call may be the difference in somebody uh, crying themselves to sleep or going to sleep in the peace that God gives. Just that little reminder, just a, a verse of scripture. Maybe a, have y'all ever had where a, like a song came on the radio at just that time when you really, you know, now if it's Caleb, you better be a certain little narrow band of songs that you really need to hear at that time. I'm, I'm just teasing, kind of. But like, there's been times when I would just get my Apple Music and I would hit shuffle 
and it's just and it's just playing through music, and I close the app and go and do something else. And then I'm two days later, I'm driving along, and I'm I'm struggling with something, or I just feel down, or whatever. And I'll just pull my pull my app up and hit play, and the very next song in my shuffle just happens to be one that just really resonates with me. See, God can do those little things like that. That's nothing for Him, but it's nothing for you to pick up the phone or. or shoot a text or shoot a note or, or maybe just a Facebook post or something just to be an encouragement. Because even Paul got discouraged. He's the Apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament, and yet he's discouraged enough, and, and God senses his discouragement. i, I got to assume this is because they didn't have text messages back then or, or the U.S. Postal Well, that's probably not a good example. Uh, <laughs> that was just for you, Ron. Uh, but, you know, they didn't have an easy means of communication, and, and God just said, i tell you what, Paul's, Paul needs it. I'm just going to encourage him in a vision. So he tells him not to be afraid, and, and he tells him something else. He says, don't be afraid, but what else does he say? Don't be silent. Uh, there's another good reminder for us. Even if you are discouraged, you still are on mission. You don't get to choose when you come on and off the mission field. You are on Everybody do this for me. Everybody go. <sighs> <sighs> all right. If you did that, you're alive. Congratulations. Some of y'all I wasn't sure about. Looked a little iffy this evening. But if you're alive, you're still on mission. If you wake up in the morning, you're on mission. God has a purpose for your life if you wake up in the morning. When he's done with you, you won't wake up. When he's through with you, you're done. You'll, you'll, you'll be through. And you'll get that promotion that we're all looking forward to. But until then, you're on mission. So he tells him not to be scared, but then he also tells him don't be silent. He says he would be protected by the Lord and his agents within the city. That's kind of cool to me, by the way. I don't know if y'all caught that. He's like, I've got you, but also i got people. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm really encouraged to hear that the Lord's got me. And, and by the way, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. But it's even more encouraging to say, hey, I got you, but also, I, I got people. And I think about some of the old times. I think about Elijah. You know, remember that story? He says, look up there. And, and his assistant was able to look up and see the army of the Lord that was, that nobody, the enemy couldn't see it. And until Elijah said, let him see him, he didn't see him. But when he saw him, he's like, okay, we're going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be all right. And I think about that when I see this, and I think that's what God was telling him. Many people believe that Paul was battling depression because of resistance from the Jews, because of the overall immorality. We talked about that last week. Uh, Corinth was a deeply immoral place. I mean, it's just a very immoral city. It's anything goes and, and everything goes. And so many people believe, many, many commentaries uh, talk about how Paul was probably starting to sink into this like depression state because of all the constant resistance. Imagine, now again, travel was not an easy thing in this time. So every time you see where it said, and Paul went to Athens or Paul traveled to uh, Thessalonica or he moved along, this is a tough, arduous journey. He's not, he's not hitting Uber on his phone app and, and getting a ride. He's not... You know, it's not a simple task. It's difficult. And there are challenges and there's, there's dangers around every corner. And so uh, Paul, this, this missionary life is really weighing on Paul. And so he, he, he needs encouragement. The Lord recognizes that. And so he comes to an division and he gives him the encouragement he needs. But I want you to notice, what is the promise? He says, I'm with you. No one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this city. But what, what is the promise? The promise is not success. Did you catch that? Hey, Paul, don't worry, man. Your church is going to double next year. Hey, Paul, don't worry. The offering next week is going to be two times what you need it to be. No, he just says, keep going. Don't be silent because I'm not going to let anybody kill you. <laughs> Ooh, yay. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to let them kill you. That's pretty much what he's saying. I'm not going to let anybody hurt you. It's still going to be bad. It's still going to be tough. You're still going to have resistance. I'm not going to make it just smooth sailing. I think sometimes that's another place that we struggle. We want God to take away every obstacle. Hello? We want God to take away every obstacle. We want him to take away every difficulty. I want to wake up immediately when my alarm goes off, not five minutes before. Does anybody else do that? Is there anything that makes you more angry first thing in the morning to wake up and look over at your clock? I could have got five more minutes. 
or like some people, miss their alarm and sleep through their eight alarms and then wind up late for class or late for work. You know, they don't want any obstacles. They want to wake up right when their alarm goes off. They want to wake up with a smile on their face and a song in their heart. They want their coffee to be, you know, good and hot and tasty. And they want the shower water to be perfect. And they want the drive to work to be perfect. They don't want to have any problems. They, need, they want to hit all the green lights. Which, by the way, if, if you ever drive down Airport Boulevard to hit all green lights, stop and pray. <laughs> That's something, something weird. The universe is off kilter or something. But, you know, that, that's not what we're told is going to happen. That's not what we're called to expect. And that's not what he tells Paul. He's not telling Paul, I'm going to remove every obstacle. He's saying, I'm not going to let them stop what you're doing. Not that it won't be difficult, just that it won't be unfruitful. He's telling him that he's not going to give him success, but he will give him security. And I'm going to tell you something. That's what we should all hope for. I, I should not expect God to remove every obstacle from my path. I should just trust God that as long as I'm doing the work, as long as I have clean hands and a pure heart, and I'm walking in as close as I know how to be, as right as I know how to be, that God is going to see me through to the other side. That really, there's not a better promise. So, so even Paul needs encouragement, and God gives him encouragement, and he gives him probably the greatest promise that anyone could ever hear in any situation. Like, ever. What promise is that? I am with you. And again, if we're not careful, we focus on the wrong thing. We think about, oh, he's going to give him protection. He's got people. No, 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 no. The most important thing is the very first thing he tells him in verse 10. I am with you. How, how could he promise him to not be afraid? How could, how could he assure him, hey, don't be afraid and don't be silent? How could he encourage him in that because he said, I'm with you? There is no greater promise in Scripture. There is no greater pinnacle that we could hope to achieve than the one that we've already been promised. And again, I'm not trying to harp on this and I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, critical because I'm as guilty of it as anybody. Lord, I want more. Lord, I need you to do X or Y. I need you to see me through this situation. I need you to give me wisdom and insight to do this. And I need, you ever notice, you ever feel like that sometimes? You ever listen to yourself pray and like, man, I'm a wonty, needy, clingy, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a stage five clinger. And I, I'm asking for a way whole lot of stuff. And then I read stuff like this. And then like when I was studying this a, a week or so ago, um, I read that and I thought to myself, you know, when I pray, I just need to say, Lord, be with me. <laughs> and, and, I, and then I realized that he is already promised to be with me. So then I needed to change my prayer again. So, Lord, help me remember that you're with me. Lord, remind me that you are with me. Remind me of your promises. Remind me of your faithfulness. Remind me of your presence. Because if I have God's presence, that's really all I need. Not all I want. I still, I'm still a stage five clinger. I mean, I still want God to do for me, but, but I, I need to make, make sure that every once in a while I do a little break check on that and say, all right, Lord, first off, thank you for your presence. Help me remember that. Help me to be mindful of the fact that you are with me, that you're never going to leave me, you're never going to forsake me, you're a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Look at Genesis 26, 24. God tells Isaac, I'm with you. And he needed to hear it at that moment. And then look at Exodus 3.12 and Exodus 33.14. In both of those times, God tells Moses, I'm with you. My presence is with you. My presence will be with you. And Moses definitely needed that at that time. So what about us? We see these people in the Old Testament when God had called them to a specific thing or maybe there was a specific challenge going on and God tells them, my presence is with you, I'll be with you. But what about us? Where is that promise for us? It's in Matthew 28. It really, when you think about it, the Great Commission is the most remarkable thing that has ever been, it's the most remarkable marching order that has ever been issued. When, when I was in the Navy, I never had a, a commanding officer or a, a supervisor, a drill instructor tell me, hey, go do this and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. 
When I worked at the nuclear plant, I never had a boss tell me, hey, go do X, Y, or Z, and I'm going to be with you the whole time. And yet the Lord of creation, the preexistent, eternal God of creation, said, here's what you're supposed to do, Hayden, and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. Emily, I want you to go and make disciples, and I'm going to walk with you every single step. There's not going to be one time, there's not going to be one situation or circumstance that you're going to find yourself in where you are alone because I will be with you always. We have no excuse for not doing the job that he has sent us to do. Because we do not do it alone. We do it with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. I am the temple. The Spirit resides within me. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19. We need to have an understanding of who we are, whose we are, and what we've been sent to do, and who goes with us in that mission to accomplish the thing that God gave us to do. We have one mission. It's the Great Commission, and we have him with us to do it. Spurgeon said, talking about this promise of Jesus here when he talks to Paul. Let me read that whole thing again. Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. For I'm with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this city. About this passage, Spurgeon said, it talks about three things. It emphasizes the presence of Jesus, the sympathy of Jesus, and the cooperation of Jesus. That's a pretty remarkable thing if you think about it. Uh, the presence of Jesus, he, he'll be with you. The sympathy of Jesus, don't be afraid. And the cooperation of Jesus, no one will lay a hand on you because I have many people in this city and I'm with you. The promise where Jesus says there, I have many people in this city, uh, likely refers to people who would respond to the gospel, not those who are already followers of Jesus. Now that's another one that will just blow your mind right there. There... There were followers of Jesus in the city, so there's possible, but I don't think there's many when you look at Corinth, and the amount of time that Paul has been there is not that great. So I believe that what Jesus is primarily speaking about it here is, is actually it is the success. You know, I told you he didn't, he didn't promise success. He kind of did. If you think about it, he says, because I have many people in this city, what did Jesus do? What was the primary mission that Jesus came to accomplish? Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to what? Seek and to save that which was lost. He came to find his lost sheep. And again, I'm not a Calvinist, but I'm just telling you, there is no way that God doesn't know because he is omniscient. He, he is all-knowing and he is eternal. He is, he is forever. There's no way that he doesn't know. He has to know. And so when he says, I have many people in that city, he knows Who's going to come? He knows whether they're his before they ever profess faith. He knows. And so he gives Paul a, a, an encouragement here. He already knows who's going to confess Christ. He already knows that Paul's efforts will not be in vain. He already knows that there's a, a good, strong contingency of people in this city. By the way, in this awful, immoral, nasty city, he already knows that there are a lot of people who are going to come to faith in Christ. And when you really think about it, it shouldn't be surprising then that he writes four more letters to the church here. He's telling us the same thing he's telling Paul here when he tells us the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, as well as what he tells us in Acts 1, 8. You'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He can promise that because he knows it. And he can promise it because he's going to keep it. Verse 11 tells us that this must have been a sufficient promise, a sufficient amount of encouragement. I can't imagine what... Listen, if, if Jesus appears to you in a vision and tells you, hey man, it's going to be okay, I got it. I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay with you and everything's going to be all right. And that's not enough to get you fired up to go the next day. You're already dead. You need to tell somebody that they need to plan the funeral. Like that, that should be enough to get us fired up and be like, hey man, I'm waking up ready to go hit the ground running, let's go. And so that's what we see because it says here in verse 11, and he stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Paul was depressed, some would say. He was at least discouraged. 
And yet he has this vision where Jesus tells him, hey, man, I'm with you. I got this. Don't worry about it. We're going to get some stuff done. And 18 months he stays there doing the work that he was discouraged in doing before this vision. Now think about that. Is that not remarkable? One, one dream, one vision at night, and he's like, hey, let's go, man. I got 18 more months in me. Let's, let's get it. Now, again, let me circle back. What, what if your text did that for somebody? What if, what if a card or a Facebook post or, or just to stop by the house with a, you know, with a, a little platter of chocolate chip cookies? What, what, if, what if you did that for somebody and it fueled them for another 18 minutes, 18 hours, 18 days, 18 months, 18 years? You never know. There's a progression of the efforts of Paul we see um, from the beginning of the chapter until this point. And I want to I show you that real quick. In verse 4, it says he was reasoning. And that, that Greek word is um, dialegamahi. And it means to discuss in argument or exhort, exhortation. So he starts with reasoning, reasoning. And then in verse 5, it says he was preaching the word. That word means to attest or protest earnestly or to witness. So first he's reasoning, he's uh, discussing, and then he's preaching, he's attesting to earnestly. And then in verse 10, it says he's teaching, didasko, uh, to teach. He's literally what it means. It, it is what it means. It means to teach. So he, he goes from discussing to, I would say, adamantly protesting to teaching. What, what is the difference? Discussing is no more than just, I have my opinion, you have yours, and I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. Most of us think that's our mission. It's not. <laughs> then he starts, it says, preaching the word, which is a, a, a Greek word. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get this. Diaratumahi. Diaratumahi. I can't say it. <laughs> but it's a very long Greek word. To attest or protest earnestly, to witness. So he goes from arguing, basically, to witnessing. And that's a big shift. Arguing is just telling you my point of view and really not hearing anything in return or trying to refute and, and have a rebuttal for everything that you say. Witnessing is more, man, I understand that you don't believe this, but let me tell you about what Jesus has done for me. Uh, I love that song, Grayson. It's a passion city. Uh, I witnessed it. That, that's what this is. This, this is that stage where you go from being that, uh, you know, like that angry person yelling at people on Facebook in all caps, and then you, get, you back off of that a little bit, and you get to that person who's like, man, look, I don't want to argue with you. I just want to tell you what Jesus did for me. Now, let me tell you this. People can argue with you over the historicity of the Bible. They can argue with you over translations of the Bible, which is ridiculous. They can argue with you over age of the earth and global warming and climate disruption or climate, whatever it is this week. It's cold, so it's climate disruption. When it gets hot, it'll be global warming again. Uh, they can argue with you over all kinds of points of view and, and opinions and all that kind of stuff. Can I, just, can I just give you some free advice? Nobody can argue with you over what happened to you. Well, I don't believe all that Jesus stuff. Okay, that's fine. Well, let me just tell you, before Jesus, I was this guy. <laughs> and by the way, I'm not going to share what we were talking earlier in the office, me and Julie and Donna, and it's just a good reminder of how far God brought me. <laughs> April, you want to say amen back there, babe? <laughs> and she didn't know the worst of it. She, she caught me late. She caught me after I'd already kind of cooled the jets a little bit. I can't, I can't make you believe the authenticity of the scriptures. I can give you facts. I can talk to you about how there's more uh, proof of old pieces of the, the Bible, full, full, full scriptures, more of those than there are copies of the Odyssey or the Iliad. We don't doubt that Homer wrote those, and yet we doubt the Bible. But I can't convince you. You can argue with me. You, well, I watched a YouTube video that said that's not true. Oh, well, if you saw it on YouTube. But here's what nobody can argue with you. What happened when you met Jesus? There, there is no way to argue with a transformed life. I can remember standing in a, in a church in Florella, First Presbyterian, uh, the Frozen Chosen there in Florella. And uh, my college roommate was in there. 
and, and I'm standing up because I've been leading worship at West, or West Side. I got a lot of West in my, in my church history. So we had been at Westside, and I'd been serving there, and so we were doing the fifth Sunday night thing, and we'd all get together at one of the local churches, and, and I get up there to lead a song or something. I look out, and I see him, and I said, I said, by the way, I said, my college roommate is here tonight, and I said, there's probably, I said, there's only one person in this room tonight more surprised that I'm up here than him, and it's me. <laughs> see, people can't argue with a changed life. They cannot argue with a transformed life. Go and do what he has told you to do, which is to witness. I'm going to tell what Jesus has done for me. I would love for everybody in here to be able to quote the Roman road and to walk through the scriptures. And I hope that's your goal. I hope you'll be working on that. It's not, it's not that many scriptures. It's not that hard to do. Uh, Romans 3.23, 6.23, 10, 9, 9 through 11 maybe. Uh, there's just not that much of them. But before, until then, stop arguing and start witnessing. And then after you witness, then... They come to Christ, and then you can teach. That's really the process of discipleship is witnessing to teaching. That's mostly what it is. This is reflective of our efforts in discipleship. When we discuss Jesus with others by telling our story or inviting them to church or whatever, and then we get into witnessing about him through the scriptures, and then we train or teach them how to follow Jesus faithfully. It's almost like what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.2. It's that process. What you have heard from me in the presence of others, teach to faithful men who will train others also. It's walking through this, what you've heard, apply. What you've applied, share. What you've shared, get somebody else to help you teach. We're going to disciple people. Listen to what else he tells him in, in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verses 2 through 5. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. Hello? But according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. That's what we're called to do. And that's what Paul was doing. And what Jesus reminded him to do was what he had already been doing. He didn't come to him in a vision to give him a new game plan. He didn't come to him in a vision to give him a brand new strategy. He came, him, came to him in a vision and said, Hey, keep doing what I've told you to do. Stop, stop waiting on the next direction. Stop waiting on the next thing to happen and just keep doing what I called you to do. And I think when you read 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5, I believe that you see Paul imparting to Timothy what the Lord had imparted to him in that vision. Not exactly the same words, but the same sentiment. Hey, they will turn away, but as for you, exercise self-control, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, do your job. It's going to be okay. And then quickly, we read about this man named Gallio. Anybody else, when you read that in your Bible, you just, it, it takes all you can do not to call him Galileo? Thank y'all. Good gracious. I know I'm not that sharp, but I really struggle with that. Every time I read it, I have to concentrate like Galileo. All right. So anyway, Galileo is the proconsul of Achaia, and he must have been sympathetic to the Jews or at least maybe adversarial to Christians or I don't know. I, I don't think that in this context... I don't think they would have had that much sway on him politically. Maybe they did. I, I'm not convinced of that. But for whatever reason, he allows uh, or two things. He allows the Jews to bring this to him, first of all. But the Jews must have thought that they had some kind of an end with him. They must have thought that this was the time to bring Paul before uh, the, the proconsul. This must have been like they thought this was their moment where they could bring him in and kind of get some, some traction. So they bring him into this tribunal and they start making accusations about him. Uh, their goal was to either get him jailed or even maybe get him kicked out or, or maybe even get him killed. Uh, we just know that they wanted him to stop. So according to sources from that period, uh, this man, Gallio, <laughs> almost did it again, he was well-liked, he was a very solid political leader, very savvy. Uh, so, so again, this is kind of a mystery as to why the Jews picked this time and why he uh, allowed them to come before him. It's helpful in dating times Paul and Corinth, though, because we know historically that uh, Gallio served for uh, two and a half years beginning in 51 A.D. So this gives us a really good window 
Uh, about 49 AD was when he was kicked out before, and now he's here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Priscilla and Aquila when we get to them. Uh, but anyway, so we know 51 AD is when this happens, or around 51 AD. So the term tribunal here is also translated as judgment seat. Uh, bima is the Hebrew word. And by the way, bima is an important thing for us to understand. There, we are going to stand before the bima uh, in judgment one day. There will be an ultimate bima. This was not it. This was the, the, the bima here in Corinth. But it's the same term used for the place that Pilate judged Jesus in Matthew 27, 19. So if that gives you any idea about the level of, of what Paul's concern might have been as he's brought before this, this tribunal, uh, this would have been an attempt to scare him, to intimidate him, to make him leave or quit. Uh, we already know that, that the Lord has come to him, and, and we could even say that maybe the Lord came to him preemptively to give him that encouragement because he knows what he's about to face is, is pretty, you know, pretty straining, pretty stressful. So, so if successful in getting this charge to stick, and, and the charge was um, um, this man persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. It's a very odd thing to say from, um, from a religious accusation to an irreligious government official. <laughs> like, I'm not sure the government official cares what you're doing, much less that this guy's telling you to do something or trying to get people to do something that's not quite jiving with that. But, but what they were trying to do... What could have happened here was really bad for Paul, but what, what also could have happened would have been really bad for everybody following Paul. Think about the precedent that would be set if a Roman proconsul in Corinth rules that Paul is not allowed to do what he's doing, everybody else across the Roman Empire could have used that same line of thinking to try to get him to stop doing that when he came to their city. So this is a pivotal, this is one of those, like, this is a Supreme Court case. You know what I mean? This is or maybe not a Supreme Court, but a federal level case, because this is going to set precedent that could have been very far-reaching and, and, and deeply impactful. So again, the, the accusation is that he's, quote, persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Um, two things here. Sorry, my nose is itching. Is that somebody coming to see me? Okay, Lord, I hope not. The only one I want to see is back there. Hey, uh, just kidding. So, so two things. Number one, this again tells you, I don't know that they really understood it, but Paul is not telling them to leave Judaism. He's telling them to take the next logical step of Judaism. He's persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. He's still telling them to worship God. Don't miss that. But he's just doing it not in, in line with the law because he's doing it in line with the Son. He, he, does that make sense? Like this is, again, further proof that he, he is taking the next logical step in his mind of being a good Jewish person is we've been looking for the Messiah. Now we found the Messiah. Now we worship God through worshiping the Messiah. So that's number one. Number two, he must have been at least fairly successful in it. Nobody argues with somebody when they don't do a good job. Like if somebody is, if you're, if you're talking about your favorite sports team and why your favorite sports team is the best and they don't know any facts, figures, championships, anything like that, you're not going to get mad at them. You're just going to ignore them, right? Walk away from them. They're so mad at Paul that they bring him before this pro council trying to use legal means to get him to stop. He must have been having success. So, so this is a pretty remarkable charge persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Now, you can flip back if you want to to chapter 16, but I want us to look at, this is the charge of the Jewish people on Paul. He, he's, he's getting people to worship God contrary to the law. Now look at the Gentiles' charge in chapter 16, verses 20 and 21. He says, This man is disturbing our city, promoting customs not legal for Romans to do. And I wanted to point out these two. In Romans 16, the Gentiles are mad at him because he's coming against Rome. In, in, in chapter 18, the Jews are mad at him because he's, he's telling them to worship God in a way that's different than the way... That, we ain't never done it that way, Ken. That's what, that's what they're, ba they're basically complaining against Paul is, hey, hey, we ain't never done it like that before. You see the difference? But do you also see the similarity? What was the main problem with both groups? Paul was upsetting the norm. 
Can I just, maybe this is news to somebody. Worshiping Jesus always, always, always upsets your norm. Always. If you, if you, if you are following Jesus, if you, if you claim to be a Christian, let's put it that way, and nothing that you've ever done, no, no, nothing that you've ever done has been interrupted by conviction from the Holy Spirit, by correction from the Word of God. <laughs> Come talk to me when we get done. I want to hear that story. Yeah, man, I've been following Jesus. I've been, you know, like 10 years. And I've never been convicted one time of anything. I've never felt bad about one thing that I've said or thought or done. Or, uh, you know, I've, I watch what I want to watch. I never have any kind of conviction about what I watch on television or movies and li- what I listen to and, you know, what I, what I put in my body. And I, I go where I want to go. I never get any kind of conviction about where I go and what I do, who I hang around with or what I believe or what I support and how I vote. And I never have one moment of conviction with any of that. I feel perfectly at ease in everything that I do. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> I, if, listen, now, if that's your testimony, I'm begging you, before I leave here tonight, you've got to come tell me all about that, how that works. Anybody? Because here's the problem. Your flesh, if you've been following Jesus for 10 years and your flesh has never gotten out of line, I've got to shake your hand. I want your autograph. Uh, we need to study you. We need to put you under a microscope. We need some DNA testing. Because your flesh is constantly trying... Mine is. Mine, my flesh is constantly trying to get out of the lines. My flesh is constantly trying to run me in a ditch. My flesh is constantly trying to get me to do something contrary to what I know the Bible tells me to do. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit going, uh-uh, oh, oh, oh boy, mm-mm, be easy. Hey, whoa, cowboy. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit reining me in, correcting my behavior, we'd have a mess on our hands. That's the, Paul, the, the Bible is full of talk about the battle that happens between the flesh and the Spirit every day. That's, I believe that's why Paul would say, I die daily. Paul is saying, I have to continue, my, my flesh has to continue to die and decay so that my spiritual self can overwhelm it and get me to do the right thing. Paul even said... The things that I know I should do, I don't do. And the things I know I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. That's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. This is corrective for us when we see that the same accusations leveled by the Jews was the same accusation leveled leveled by the Gentiles, which is this Jesus is messing our our whole game plan up. I hope he's messing yours up. I hope, I hope your flesh is uncomfortable because your spirit, the spirit in you, is constantly pushing you to, to move away from the things of the flesh and give yourself over more and more to the things of the spirit. Now what's amazing to me is the response of Gallio. He says, this, hey, blah, 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 blah. that's what he does. He, he kind of, they start talking. He goes, blah, 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 blah. this ain't got nothing to do with me. He said, this Roman law... It's what I'm responsible for, not this foolishness that you're talking about. Before they even, before they even finished what they were saying, before they went into their, they gave their like thesis statement, and before they got to even, oh, I, bet, I bet it made them mad. I bet you they had a page full of notes, Gino. You know, I bet you that guy was like, let me tell you. <laughs> Flipped his little notepad open and started, he was about to read all the bad things that Paul had done. And Galileo goes, I, 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 stop. Paul doesn't even have a chance to do a rebuttal before he dismisses the case. He just, he, he just tosses them out. He says, uh, these are questions about your words, names, your own law. See to it yourselves. I don't want to be a judge of such things. This ain't got anything to do with me. He chastises them for even bringing this before him. Now, we talked about the fact that, that Paul being found guilty would have set a precedent. This kind of sets a precedent as well. At least for this group, they're like, well, we barked up that tree and didn't do us any good. But then verse 17 shows exactly how the adversary operates. The adversary went against Paul, tried to get them to bring him to court so he could get him kicked out, get him thrown in jail, get him maybe even killed. The enemy is constantly trying to stop and thwart 
the work of God. That's why we have so many problems. Number one, our flesh is our worst enemy. Number two, we have an adversary and he has an army of, of minions that work with him to try to help keep us from the things that God has given us to do. Now, I'm not going to give you my speech again, but I just want to remind you, Satan is a very powerful being, but he is one being. He is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere. He's just one very powerful, very bad dude. No offense, but more than likely, you don't rate having Satan himself come attack you. So this not today Satan, you're not that important. Calm down. Now you may, get, you may be getting attacked from some other little third wheel minion, but more than likely it's just that battle of flesh and spirit that we talk about. And rather than just say, not today, Kevin, <laughs> I choose to give Satan the, uh, the credit for me making bad decisions. So, so he doesn't stop at the failure of getting Paul thrown out. Look at verse 17. Then they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judge's bench. Again, this is another good reminder that there was no uh, Miranda rights. There was no, you know, ACLU. There was no, you know, Bill of Rights, Constitution. This was a, this was a very different society, which is very hard for us as Americans. Uh, if you've never traveled around the world and seen a lot of different cultures, you really struggle sometimes to understand how different this this context was. But, but they, they jump on him, and, and all here, the word all, it could be, uh, sometimes it's translated all the Greeks. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not dogmatic that it was just Jews or just Gentiles. Maybe all the Greeks meant Jews and Gentiles, but were from a Greek background, I don't know. But, but they didn't want Paul to preach, so they grabbed Sosthenes, who was a synagogue leader, and beat him in plain view of the authorities, who did nothing because they considered this a Jewish issue, not a Roman issue. This was a religious issue, not a uh, legal issue. So they were like, whatever. I mean, I just, I kind of picture the guy looking going, Pfft, and he just walks away and lets them beat on this guy. Now, it, it's possible. Now, now go with me here. We're, we're kind of getting outside the bounds a little bit, just using logic. It's possible that Sosthenes replaced Crispus when he put his faith in Jesus. Remember, Crispus is, uh, is mentioned um, in 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul refers to him as our brother. Uh, Sosthenes is mentioned there, I mean, as our brother. Now, Crispus, we know, Paul says he baptized him, so we know he made a profession of faith. It's possible that that's what got him boot, booted out of the synagogue leadership position and Sosthenes brought in. And then yet Sosthenes is, is beaten by these Jews and Gentiles I don't know whether or not the beating pushed him to Jesus or if he had already come to Jesus and that's why he took the beating because they didn't feel like, they felt like he had betrayed him. I don't know. Again, Paul mentions, in, mentions Sosthenes in 1 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1, and he calls him our brother. So we, we have to, you know, there may have been another Sosthenes, but it may have been this guy. Uh, if he were a Christian, or at least if he was sympathetic to Paul's message at the time, it would make perfect sense why they seized him and beat him after getting this disappointing ruling from Gallio. Maybe they thought that Sosthenes had been kind of a double agent. Like he had said, hey, we're gonna, I'm going to go with you to take this to Gallio. Or, or maybe he helped get them an audience with Gallio. It's possible that he even had talked to Gallio previously and said, hey, man, these guys are just, you know, like Paul's the, Paul's the real deal. Don't mess with him. We, we don't know. That's this, this not something that we get in the text. So let's stick with what we do know. What we do know is they didn't jump on and beat Paul. Now, why? Anybody else catch that? Like, who's on trial? Paul. Who did they want to stop? Paul. What were they mad about? Paul's preaching. What, what were they, they wanted to kill Paul's mission. They wanted to stop, and yet they didn't beat on Paul. They beat on the synagogue leader, Sosthenes. Why? The answer to why they beat on Sosthenes is found in the first verses that we read. 
When Jesus told Paul, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I'm with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you. This is not in the scripture. I'm, 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 I'm out here... I'm out here just using my imagination, okay? I'm a visual learner. Y'all know that. I always put myself in the stories. That's how I study the Bible. So, so I, and by the way, I'm never the hero in the, in the, when I put myself in the story. I'm always like a janitor in the court. It's like pushing a mop. Ball. I'm, never, I'm never the hero. I'm never like, ah, I'm not going to let you touch Paul. No, I'm never me. So, so here I am. I'm pushing the mop or broom or whatever, and I look over, and, and in my sanctified imagination, I can picture them enraged by, by the way, Gallio was completely dismissive. Like, he's like, hey, miss me with all of this junk. This ain't my gig. Beat it. He, he shut them up and sent them packing, and they were enraged. They were infuriated. Here's what I picture. They're like, I'll tell you what, I'm about to mash Paul, and, and then they couldn't touch him. <laughs> I don't even know if maybe they swung at him, and they, they you know, it's like that. They couldn't, they couldn't make their fist hit him. I, again, I don't know. I, that's, I, I'm just telling you, I, in my mind, I'm picturing, if, here's what I'm, I'm going to tell you this, and I will stand on the Word of God to tell you this. If they had tried to put their hands on Paul, they would have been unsuccessful. I don't know that that's why, I don't know that they couldn't touch him, that they tried to and they couldn't, and so they were like, well, let's get the next, the next guy in order. We'll go to the Sosthenes. We'll beat on him because we can't touch Paul. I don't know that for sure. What I know for sure is that if they wanted to touch Paul, they would not have put a finger on him. Why do I know that? Because Jesus told him they wouldn't. You believe that? Do you believe that there is no way any of these men could have put their hands on Paul? Then why don't you believe that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or imagine? Here's a better question. Are you praying like you believe that? Are you living like you believe that? Are you witnessing like you believe that? See, now I'm meddling. Do you believe they could have put their hands on Paul? No, preacher! Do you believe you can do anything? That you, that with him? Nothing's impossible with God. You can do all things through Christ? Hmm. I'd like to think so. <laughs> that ain't what he said. He didn't say, hey, if you want to, you can think that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He said... Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to go one step further. When all this stuff started, I don't think Paul broke a sweat. I don't think he broke a sweat standing before the proconsul. I don't think he broke a sweat when he saw the rage in the eyes of his opponents. I think the, the encouragement God gave him in that vision, when he saw the Lord tell him, don't be afraid, don't be silent, keep doing what I told you to do, ain't nobody going to lay a hand on you. I think he took it to heart. I think he believed it. And here's my question. We'll close with this. And by the way, just FYI, I'm asking me the same question. I'm not, I'm not asking... I'm not asking you without asking me. If Paul believed it, why don't I? If Paul believed the promise of God, why don't we believe the promises of God? You don't think he can deliver you from that addiction? He says he can you don't think he can save your marriage? He says he can. You don't think you can trust him with your money? You don't think you can trust him with your time? You don't think you can trust him with your life? He said you could. No weapon formed against you will succeed.
I want us to believe like Paul believed. I'm going to remind you, we serve the same God Paul served. We are the same vessels that Paul was. We have the same Holy Spirit in us that Paul had. We can do greater things than these if we will simply trust and obey. You see, trusting is believing, but seeing is believing, right? So we can't just believe it in a vacuum. We have to go live it out to show that we believe it. What is it that he's promised you that you don't trust him with? What is it that he's calling you to do that you just don't think he can see you through? What is it that he's calling you to do that you just think is too big for you to accomplish? He simply told Paul, don't be silent, don't be afraid, don't quit preaching, I've got your back. And I believe tonight he's telling us the same thing. We live in a world that increasingly doesn't want to hear the message that we have to preach to bring uh, I noticed this week uh, one of the podcasts I listened to got an explicit, you know, little E. And, and it's a Christian. These, these guys are all Christians. It's a secular station, but they're all Christians. They talk about their faith openly. Uh, they, don't, they don't use any explicit language. And yet they got marked with explicit. And the only thing we could figure out is that, that there are some algorithms that look for spiritual things and they mark spiritual things as explicit we're living in a world that is increasingly hostile toward what we believe and yet our job our command our call has not changed we are to take the gospel as it is to people as they are and if you don't believe that jesus can protect you and make sure that you are uh, successful in what he has commanded you to do come back and read the first part of this that we read tonight acts 18 7 through 10. Go read it. And know that the promise he made to Paul, he's making to us. Look, they, they may kill me when I walk. I may walk in here tonight and have some, some radical group out there that doesn't want me to preach, and they may kill me dead as a wedge. Can I tell you something? I will never have been more alive in the existence of time if they kill me tonight. I'm not going to be worried about what else they can do or what else they can say because I know that God has told me, don't be afraid, don't be silent, keep doing what I've told you to do, and I've got you. I hope you believe that too. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the night and the time to study your word and, and just look at uh, a simple time where you encouraged Paul in a time that he needed it, and then he just flat believed it. And Lord, I pray that we would do that. I pray for each person in here, each person that hears my voice saying this, that they would, they would, this would resonate with them, that they could do just what Paul did, take you at your word. You've promised to never leave us. Even in the mission that you gave us, you said you would be right there with us, even until the end of the age. Lord, help us to take you at your word and to trust you with everything that we have so that we can do big things for you because you are a big God. And you've called us to something that you're going to see us through to completion. I pray, God, that each person here would, would know that they are not alone, that they are not um, forsaken. And if they've put their faith in Christ, that you are with them and you will see them through everything you call them to do. Help us to be obedient. Help us to see your hand in all of it. And help us to give you the glory for all that's accomplished. We pray this in Christ's strong name. Amen. God bless you guys.